you forgive our sins and fill us with your spirit so that we may open the Bible now and read there your words for us, that are there for us. And that we can correctly understand what we read and that we can be transformed by it into perfect children of God. We ask that you protect us from evil, from within and from without, and for us this time that we spend together now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we continue, despite everything, our study of Luke. Last week we finished studying through verse 6 of chapter 22. Tonight we'll start at verse 7 and go as far as verse 30 of chapter 22, following a, a very brief review. Here, somewhat. And just what it is, my five-part outline that I've been using. I remind everyone that the, it begins with a dedication to the reader, the author, um, and it tells tells us that um, that what Luke is doing in this document is placing within an orderly narrative, in an orderly story form, the things that were known about Jesus at, at that time. And he's doing this so as to give confidence to Christian believers who he's, he's writing to. Uh, much of what we understand about this gospel depends on where Jesus came from and who and what Jesus is and who lays that out in those first four verses. Then in the Galilean ministry, we see Jesus' power and authority uh, work in the world, we see what that looks, what that looks like. What he can do and how people respond to him. And then on the road to Jerusalem, we hear Jesus preaching and teaching things that we need to hear. And things that we need to hear and apply into our lives. Jesus then arrives at Jerusalem. And as he approaches Jerusalem, it's a scene of triumph, of, of victory, followed immediately by sadness and weeping over Jerusalem, reflecting, I think, the bittersweet mission that Jesus is on. It, it ends ultimately in the end in, in complete victory, but it passes through much suffering and much sorrow. <clears throat> we, we find out that when Jesus gets to Jerusalem, he spends all day, every day, in the temple, and what he does there is, is teach, and he exhibits as he teaches in the temple great authority, and he attracts large crowds of, of people. The Jewish leaders see him there, showing forth his, his authority, attracting all of these, these crowds, and so they become afraid of him, and they try to trap Jesus and to embarrass Jesus, but they have no success. I was thinking tonight for the first time, it's very like at the beginning of the gospel where Jesus is taken out into the desert and tempted by Satan, but Satan has no success now. Near the end here, he, he is tempted by the scribes and the, um, and, and the elders and um, the priests, and they also have no success in treating Jesus and for trapping him and bringing him down. However, popular Jesus is with the crowds, then his words and deeds are very difficult for the Jewish leadership to accept. And Jesus' teaching regarding the resurrection undercuts the authority of, of the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection. Jesus teaches that, that there is a resurrection. Um, Jesus' teaching regarding the Christ undercuts the ideas that people had of a literal and worldly resurgence of the kingdom of David and of the nation of Israel. Jesus' teaching regarding the hypocrisy of, of Jewish religious leaders and those who are powerful and wealthy in one hand naturally offends these people who are powerful and wealthy. And finally, then Jesus prophesies the destruction that's coming on the city of Jerusalem and on the temple in Jerusalem. That would be, that's a prophecy of the end of much of the earthly leaders' power base. Their, their power is based in Jerusalem, it's based on the temple and Jesus' teaching that 
that soon not a stone will be left uh, of the temple in Jerusalem. In its place, in place of this, this temple in Jerusalem, Jesus predicts the coming of a kingdom, the kingdom of God, which is the eternal kingdom, and the source of hope beyond all death and destruction which, which precedes it. So we have now understood that Jesus is proclaiming beyond much difficulty and suffering, ultimately he's proclaiming and, and foreseeing the coming of the kingdom of, of God. And it's within this context that the great difficulty that he foresees followed by the eternal peace and joy that Jesus then sounds a warning to the people who are listening to him, the disciples for sure, but other people as well. Remember Jesus' teaching there in um, chapter 21, verses 34 through 38. He says, watch yourselves. Don't fall into dissipation. Don't fall into drunkenness. Watch yourselves. Remain awake. Be prayerful so that you can stand before the Son of Man. So, in summary, to this point, I'm moving very quickly through this review because we've done it so many times. Jesus teaching and Jesus person diminishes the current power structure that's rooted in the temple and in Jerusalem by prophesying the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and by prophesying the replacement of the temple in Jerusalem by something that's great. That, that is the kingdom of, of God, which is finally, finally to come. He continues teaching. Um, the crowds continue flocking around him, especially like at times like we're coming up to like the Passover celebration when Jews from all over the world are flocking into Jerusalem and flocking into the temple. There's Jesus teaching. The leaders are afraid because all of the people are coming and because they're so attracted to Jesus and because Jesus' message really looks beyond the, the base of their power to a future kingdom, which is very different from the one that they have and the one that they were expecting. And I think it's basically fair to say that it's because they're afraid of losing control, of losing power, that the priests and the scribes and the elders and the Pharisees, like the Pharisees before them, are, are worried of losing their, their power, their place, their control in this world. So they're seeking, the Bible tells us, the ways to kill Jesus. The time is coming. We know that Jesus came to earth to be, to be killed and to rise from the dead. He's, he's told his disciples for several times to come to hell. But now in the story that we read, we've come to that time when it's time for Jesus, Jesus to be killed. And in last week's reading, chapter 22, verses 3 through 6, we saw then that Satan enters into Judas, that Satan is one of the twelve disciples. I mean, Satan enters into Judas as one of the twelve disciples. And then this Judas, full of Satan, goes to the Jewish leadership, was looking for a way to kill Jesus, and he offers to betray Jesus to them. And they're happy about that. They agree to pay him money, so he will betray Jesus into their hands so that they can kill him. That's our review, and now we're poised to see what will happen next in tonight's, in tonight's lesson. What will happen to Jesus? Did anybody have any comment or question about any of that stuff? If not, Steve, could you please um, read uh, mm -hmm. chapter 22? Yes. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. 
prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And you can hopefully see on the screen there a picture of the man carrying water and Jesus was sent to the disciples to go So Luke 22, 7. We have then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. We know from our study of the Old Testament that the Jews celebrated in accordance with God's instructions, that the Jews celebrated a number of religious holidays throughout, throughout the year, including the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread, you'll understand probably from your reading of the Old Testament, are to remind the Jews of the time when God delivered them out of slavery in Egypt. And when they, they, they lived their time on unleavened bread as they traveled out, out of Egypt. The precise rules whereby Jews have celebrated Passover and the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread have changed over time depending on the circumstances of the Jew, you know, whether, whether there was a tabernacle, whether there was a temple depending on how many tribes there still were and, and how the nation was divided. And in these later times, Jews still celebrate the Passover, even though there's no temple in Jerusalem and hasn't been for 2,000 two years In Jesus' day, we understand that Passover was celebrated mostly or not only in Jerusalem. So Jews wishing to celebrate the Passover would have to come, come to Jerusalem. Partly because it was only at the temple in Jerusalem that Passover lambs could be properly sacrificed. We understand that they needed to be sacrificed in the outer court, the, the court of the Gentiles, the lambs would be sacrificed. So a Jew wishing to celebrate a Passover meal would have to come to Jerusalem and the lamb would be sacrificed in the temple. And then they would celebrate the, the meal with the lamb. So I don't know if you remember, but back in chapter 2, when Jesus was 12 years old, we heard the story about the time that Mary and Joseph left Jesus behind in the temple. And in chapter 2, verse 41 and following, that's where you see it. And there it says that it was the custom of Jesus' family, that it was, it was the custom of Joseph and Mary, Jesus', Jesus parents, to go every year to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So, this is not the first time Jesus has celebrated the Passover in Jerusalem. One can imagine he's been there many times throughout his life, starting from when he was a young boy. And we have no reason to believe that Jesus suspended the custom of celebrating the Passover or any other Jewish um, religious observance, the, the, the Sabbath and so on. Jesus obeyed all of these things during his lifetime. And so he's in Jerusalem now, we read, because it's time for good godly Bible-believing Jews to be there, why so that they can celebrate the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And now we know that Jesus, for other reasons, is actually in Jerusalem. He's gone down the road to Jerusalem. He's, he's come there now finally for his final mission to die and rise from, from the dead. So naturally, of course, while he's there in the time of Passover, he's going to celebrate the, the Passover and he'll do it in whatever way is considered at that time by the teachers of the law to be proper, one would, one would think. We understood by reading the Bible at various points and in various ways that Jesus perfectly obeyed the laws of Moses during his lifetime. And this would be true here also. As I mentioned last week, the synoptic authors, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all seem to understand that the last supper that Jesus shared with his disciples, in which we st so, still celebrate in our church as the last supper, the Lord's Supper, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the way they write all of them, it seems like the last supper that Jesus shared with his disciples was a Passover meal. It was the Passover meal um, at, at, this, at this time. Whereas if you read John carefully, what you'll, what you'll see is that John seems to think 
that the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples. And John spends five chapters talking about the Last Supper. And it includes the famous scene where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. It's a, a big description of, of the Last Supper Jesus had with his disciples. But in John's Gospel, it seems like the Last Supper happened before the Passover. And so there's a difference of about one day, approximately one day, between the, the, where the Passover happened in the narrative as told by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the narrative as was told, was told by John. Writing earlier than any of that, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, where he spells out how one is to observe the Lord's Supper, makes no mention at all of the Lord's Supper being a Passover celebration. Although elsewhere, Paul says things that will speak of Jesus as the, as the Passover lamb and so forth in his teaching about this. I Paul doesn't remember that it was a Passover. And not only that, if you spend time like I did when I first became a Christian and you, you look through the Bible carefully and you compare everything, there's, there are those minor differences in the New Testament. If you try to go back and compare to the instructions that were originally given through Moses to, to the children of Israel in the Old Testament, it's a little bit difficult to match everything up with that too. So for example, in the Old Testament, you wouldn't know what is the day of unleavened bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread in the Old Testament lasts for seven days. Passover is a one-day celebration at the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So maybe he means, when he says the day of unleavened bread, he means the day sort of before the beginning where people go through their house and, and get rid of all the leaven in their house as, as instructed. He could mean that. Uh, but just notice, and again, I'm not going to dwell on this anymore, that if you carefully try to, to compare all of these things, you're not going to be the first person in 2,000 years who notices uh, that there, there are some of these minor differences that are basically impossible. And from this, I draw two positive conclusions. The first is that the church has always been terribly respectful of the biblical text, especially those that include the words of Jesus. Um, New Testament scholars started soon after the Jesus walked here would have noticed that it's like, like what I'm talking about. And they never forced to harmonize them. They never tried to get the timing the same as John as it was in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They never tried to get the New Testament to line up perfectly to Exodus or to Numbers or to, to, to Deuteronomy. And so that means that you can trust the Bible text because human beings aren't playing with it, even when there are difficulties which, which are, uh, can be a little bit confusing. But the second meaning to me seems even more important, and that is that the meaning here does not require such harmonization. This is not magic. This is not an incantation where Jesus is trying to precisely reenact the Old Testament or something like that. Or where the only way that we can celebrate the Lord's Supper is if we have the timing and the details exactly right. That's not the way God is. That's, that's not the way um, you know, Jesus celebrated, and it's probably not the way we should be thinking that we celebrate. This is not magic. This is not some formula that we have to follow. This is, the, the meaning is, is deeper and more profound, profound than that, right? So it doesn't matter whether the Passover meal was the Last Supper or one day different, because when Paul tells the church how to celebrate the Lord's Supper, he doesn't even mention the Passover. He just says that the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, is so that we'll remember the Lord until he comes. Okay. That's that. So in Luke's orderly narrative, you know, he's, he's putting these important things in, in a sort of a, 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 an understandable story form. What happened in the end of Jesus' life, just before his crucifixion, while he was with his disciples. He wanted to spend a, a last meal with his disciples. It was during the Passover season in Jerusalem, and that's really all he said to What What follows? Um, so, it's it's the season of the Passover, the time when when people sacrifice a lamb, and Jesus and his disciples are going to observe that along with everybody else in Jerusalem. 
That's the context of the, of the story that we're reading. So because of that, Jesus sends his disciples, and only Luke mentions which disciples. Luke tells us that it's Peter and John, sort of the leading two disciples in Jesus' inner circle. Peter, John, and James are most often mentioned as the disciples closest to Jesus. Luke seemed to think it was important for us to understand this. And Jesus sends Peter and John, no less, and he tells them to go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat of, of it. So it doesn't matter the exact time and dates, because Jesus wants to arrange a meal with his disciples. He says that we may eat of it. So we should, includes Jesus, and it includes Peter, and it includes John, and it includes other people, presumably his, his other disciples. And the reason for the meal, there might have been several reasons, but one of them is to celebrate the Passover, which requires special preparation in the rest of the meal. Go prepare. A meal during the Passover season is not precisely the Passover meal. And so they asked Jesus, they said, okay, you can ask me to go to prepare a Passover meal some place, but they said, where, where will you have us prepare? And so it's certain from their response that they had no place in Jerusalem where they certainly belonged, where they would have naturally assumed that they were going to go there. We, we read last, last week that they were spending their nights on the Mount of Olives, coming into Jerusalem early in the morning. Jesus was teaching all day on the temple. And then at night they go back to the Mount of Olives, wherever they, wherever they were staying. It seems they had no place in Jerusalem where, where they were, were staying. And it seems from their response to the sympathy to Jesus, well, where would you have us prepare? They don't even have any guesses. If they were disciples who thought, well, maybe he means this or maybe he means that, they might say, well, do you want us to do it here? Do you want us to do it there? They don't. It's a completely open-ended question. They have no idea where it might be here that they could go to celebrate at the Passover together. It's almost as if, to me, they're even skeptical that there could be a place in Jerusalem where Jesus and his disciples could safely go to celebrate the Passover. Because on the one hand, if their location is known, the crowds that have been mobbing them in the temple are going to mob them at this private dinner. And on the other hand, if they're away from the crowd, the, the priests and the scribes who are looking for a way to kill them are going to catch them along the way from the crowd. And so it's actually not easy, probably, to think about where in Jerusalem you would go to have a Passover meal between Jesus and his disciples and not be bothered by crowds of the enemies. So they're kind of stuck. So they take it back to Jesus and they ask him to solve the problem. And Jesus solves the problem. But notice Jesus doesn't answer their question by giving them the location of the supper. He doesn't say to go to this or that specific place. And you might ask yourself, you know, why is that? Why does Jesus not just tell them where to go, the address of the name of the house, or, was, or, or its proximity to the temple, or some landmark, or something you might have given them. And again, a lot of people have thought the reason for that is that if Jesus were to say a precise location in the hearing of his disciples and other people, then that would have easily led his enemies to wherever they go to celebrate the supper, or it would have led a mob of people there, which would have protected him, but defeated his purpose of having an intimate last supper with his disciples. Or it might have Judas heard it, and then Judas might have been able to give the address to the, to the priests and the officials that he's talking to, trying to betray Jesus to his death. And so Jesus basically is really controlling this situation. He, he knows he's going to let himself be taken and killed. But he's not going to let them take him until it's time. And in the meantime, like through his whole ministry, through his whole life up to now, Jesus controls everything. Everything is within his, within his power and his control. So these two trusty, most trusty disciples, Peter and, and, and John, go into the city. They're supposed to go into Jerusalem. And there's some guy waiting there to, to meet them. They're going to be met by a man. And the only way I can read this is that the man is waiting for, for that. The, the man is, is waiting, expecting somebody to come looking for him. He's expecting for somebody to come looking for a man with the jug of water on his shoulders, which is why he's carrying the jug of water to identify himself to them when they, when they come to see him. And a lot of the commentators say men never carried water in those days. And so they're almost that women carried a lot of water. But seeing a man carrying a water jug would have been like putting a 
pink carnation in your hotel, you know, <laughs> if you're waiting for a spot in the movie or something. That's what he's doing. <laughs> the water is like that as a signal to the disciples when they come. They realize that he's, that he's our guide by that, by that symbol. Um, so the man knows the way for them, the man knows the watch for them, and the man knows where to take them once they see him. You know, see them. These two guys come up, they're looking for a guy with a watch for them. He's okay, and then he takes them to some place. And clearly the man seems to know exactly where he's supposed to lead them to, to go. Once they, once they follow him, he leads them into a certain house. In, in the man gave the follow him into the house that he enters. He's going to enter a house, and that's the signal for the disciples to know that that's the house where they're supposed to prepare the Last Supper. And pretty much, I think, most people have agreed that the way that you understand this is that the man with the water jar has been enlisted in, in advance somehow by Jesus into his service. Jesus has made these, these arrangements. And if you think about it, that would so, be so easy for Jesus to do. Every day from morning until night, he meets dozens, hundreds, thousands of people of all different kinds, including people who own houses. And, and, and a lot of these people, as his disciples, are almost his disciples, anxious to talk to him. So for Jesus, to, to pick from the many choices that he would have had in the temple in Jerusalem, so can I arrange a quiet dinner for me and my disciples? Come on could be totally a, a normal arrangement, just clever, but you know, not something that you or I could have done. Or perhaps Jesus gives some supernatural you know, power to arrange this, but either way, it doesn't matter. We already know Jesus has all power. Everything we studied up until now says he, he has power over everything. So whether he does it normally or whether he does it supernaturally, still he's in control of the situation and he's accomplishing his, his, objective, his objective here. As, as he'll reiterate here in a second, is to have, he, he desperately longs to have a sort of private dinner with his, with his disciples. So he's going to be safe for the time being from Satan slash Judas, who are already actively looking for a way to betray him to the authorities who are already looking for a way to kill him. Jesus knows all that stuff is happening. He's not ready for it to happen yet. He wants this to happen first. And that may be significant, come to think of it. You know, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we might want to remember that the first Lord's Supper happened in that zone. You know, between knowing that the forces of evil were hovering about trying to take Jesus. Knowing that Jesus would rise from the dead and be victorious and finally usher in the kingdom of, of God. But the Lord's Supper kind of happens in between those, those, those things. Maybe that's, a, that's an interesting reflection that one might, one might have. And so Jesus tells them that when the guy leads him into the house, he's going to show you a large upper room that's furnished and that they should prepare. The, the supper there. Um, the Bible commentators say that furnished might might mean not so much furniture, but furnished with tables and the table covering and the stuff and the stuff and the to a large room that's been set up for, for the Lord's Supper. Perhaps it's already been arranged to some extent for the disciples to come and finish their, their preparation. So when the disciples go into the room, I imagine painters throughout the, the centuries have imagined they're going to see like a number of places at the table which are roughly equal to the number of disciples that there are. And they're going to know what kind of dinner it's supposed to be. Most would imagine there was going to be 13 seats at the table, Jesus plus 12 for his 12 disciples. There might have been slightly more or less depending on something, but it's that kind of a room, which would have still been a pretty large room from what I understand in Jerusalem or private home to have. And they can see that they're supposed to set up in the Passover for Jesus in a group of, of disciples. And lo and behold, when they go, Jesus' instructions work, of course, perfectly. There was no, no surprise. Everything went according to the plan. They only had to make the the Passover. So I think from all of this, we, we should take, again, I probably already said this, the notion that this was not a chance meeting. This wasn't an ordinary supper, right? 
but something that was carefully prepared and also carefully protected by, by, by God the Son. In every detail, um, it was to him a very important supper. And we still remember it all these centuries later that we remember and celebrate that the Lord's Lord Supper. Jesus, in his time, is making in time for the last confidential words of his disciples that they have until they meet together in the kingdom of God. All right, so the, the Last Supper is, is ready to go. Now we read about the Last Supper. So Steve, could you read verses 14? Yeah. <coughs> and when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. So the picture that I have up is one of thousands, I guess, that you can find in art galleries and online, you know, pictures of the Lord's Supper. So this, this is certainly not the most famous painting that we have of the, the Last Supper, but to me, it, in the time I had it, it seems to be the most likely to be a, a, a genuine representation of what the Lord's Supper might have looked like. You get an idea from this picture when the Bible uses this phrase, reclining at tables. Mm -hmm. I don't know, sort of like me and the Kotatsu, right? <laughs> sort of, you know, leaning on one arm and eating this, this way. It was a habit they picked up from the Romans, by the way. I don't think that was the natural Jewish way of eating in days of the Bible. But an important meal that they were really prepared and people really came to have an important meal together, that would be kind of the way it might look. Um, again, I, I just reminded in John's Gospel, he devotes five full chapters um, to, to the supper. And it's not, it's not a Passover meal in John. The synoptics lean in the direction, seemingly, of the last, this last supper being a Passover meal. But you'll notice there's no mention, not one word of a lamb. They're not eating lamb. There's it's possible that this was another meal, you know, not precisely Passover, but just like John said, a meal a little bit before the Passover that Jesus has arranged. To me, the last supper that we commemorate for this very day, uh, but not going heavily on Passover motifs, as, as, as they say. Just like Paul does not draw in the Passover motif and explaining to the church how they should celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's not a Passover meal, but it's the last supper of Christ. And so, when the time comes, then, for this carefully arranged meal that Jesus has in mind that he wants to do, Jesus sits down at the table, reclines at the table with them in that intimate setting, like, like what I had up, and, and it says, and the apostles with him. So this kind of answers, I guess, the question before. Who is the us that Jesus wants to have the meal with? It's, it's Jesus. It's Peter and, and uh, John. But it's the apostles, and here the apostles means the twelve, almost, almost certainly. Um, and just the apostles, he doesn't say the apostles and others, and so I'm most likely it's, it's 13 people that are Jesus plus the twelve. Uh, 
In some of the Gospels, other Gospels, it seems a bit more like Judas left early on. In Luke's Gospel, it doesn't. In Luke's Gospel, it would seem like there's no distinction to be made between Judas and the others. Later, Jesus is going to say, the kind of view who betrays me is at the table. And so we almost get the feeling that Judas is there for that. <coughs> When it says that they that, uh, if, that, that they reclined the table and the, and the apostles with them, I think the, the thought is that they were gathered there to eat and drink something, whether or not there's a lamb or bitter herbs or the other accoutrements of a formal Passover meal that like the Jews would celebrate. There is a table and there is stuff that's on it prepared as, as we'll see. So most people understand they sat down to eat a meal with Passover meal or meal around the time of Passover. And then Jesus tells them that he is earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I
home party is, is already foretold and expected. That'll be the coming of the Son of Man. There is going to be a homecoming when they're all the united so the resurrection of the of God. But until that day, this is the last time. And that's it's kind of a preview of the end, right? It's, it's the last view before the end of the, of the union in this way of Christ and his disciples as men, as men on earth. And you remember the way the Apostle Paul instructs the church in Corinth about celebrating the Lord's Supper. He says, we do this to celebrate the memory of the Lord until he comes, right? And so that's what it is. It's, it, even here in the Gospels, it's the same as what Paul describes later. This meal is celebrating Jesus and, and helping them to remember until they're reunited again in some future. And now Jesus fills this remembering dinner with some contents here um, that all of the gospel authors remember and the church has celebrated as an ordinance, as, as, a, um, as we say, the Protestant churches as an ordinance. Um, it's something Jesus and, and the apostles taught us that we should continue to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Why so we remember Jesus on the couch, same with the original people who attended the Supper. And at the Supper, all the apostles were there. The apostles are the big source of most of the original material that the Gospel authors used to write the Gospels that were studied. And all of them heard in a loud way you know, and understood the importance of the things Jesus said and did at this last Supper that he had. And so, they try to remember his words, and they try to understand the significance of it and explain it to you know the, the, the young church in, in the, by writing it in the Bible. Uh, and that's what we're reading. One of these accounts, the one that Luke remembers based on what he had heard from various sources about the Last Supper. And what he remembers is that in the Last Supper, he, Jesus, began by taking a cup, gave thanks, so, so a prayer, thanksgiving. And then said to his disciples, you know, take this wine, this, this cup, and pour it out and divide it, divide it on yourself. But this is a kind of a holy toast. The Son of God has given thanks for it. And he shared it out among his, his 12 apostles. And he's asked them to pour it out and share it among, among them themselves. And so I think it's a kind of a, of a, of a fellowship. Symbol. We don't, this is not part of the ceremony of the Lord's Supper that we follow when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We follow the second giving of wine, but not this first one. And this may have something to do with the Passover because people who studied the celebration of Passover in the first century say there would have been four or five times during the Passover meal when there would have been a cup and a toast and, and a sharing of, of wine. And so perhaps as they celebrated that, you know, the disciples remember the first one, they remember it was one where they shared it all the rest, a sort of fellowship drink in, in, in the beginning, in which everyone participated. And, and then Jesus says the reason why he wants to do that is because from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So Jesus repeats the thought from before, which is referred to just sort of the, the Passover. He wants them to share this drink because, for, for I tell you, he wants them to share this drink because for Jesus, it's going to be the last time to do so with them in person until the coming of the kingdom of God. It's the last time they'll have fellowship. It's the last time they'll share a drink. Or a room, or time, or life, you know, in the ordinary human sense. This is a real party between them that he wants to remember. And it won't happen again until they're reunited in the kingdom of God. And some of the um, New Testament, some of the Luke manuscripts actually leave out this verse because they were aware that the church didn't celebrate two cups during the Lord's Supper and they, they seem to have wanted to stick close to the, to the description by Paul later of the celebration of the Lord's Supper. But I think all the best Bible texts and translations do include this verse. I mean, just notice that the cup was circulated twice, once in the beginning and once later, and that both of them don't make their way into our celebration of the Lord's Supper, but only the, the second one seems, seems to. 
And then they finished with the, the, that first sort of fellowship drink. And now Jesus starts feeling that the, the celebration is more. We, we would all agree, looking back, with, with more theological significance. Right? It's not just fellowship anymore. Now Jesus is symbolizing Dumb Red, and he's sort of foreseeing the significance of what he's about ready to do through his death on the cross. And so he must surely be in Jesus' mind to understand the words that he speaks here. The verse 19 says, he took the bread, again he gave thanks, and he broke the bread and he gave it to and said, this is my body which is given to you, do this in remembrance of, of me. Right. So Jesus now is using the table, not just as a, a time of final fellowship, but he's continuing his basic role of teaching. He's been teaching ever since he started with his disciples. He's been teaching ever since he got to Jerusalem. He's teaching us still. Now just as apostles in, in, in this last supper, and he shares those sounds. It's like an act of prophecy. Sometimes you see prophecies in the Bible, and they'll be physically enacted. Um, and, and here, Jesus is using the, the bread and the meal and, and the words that he speaks as a sort of enacted prophecy, which will be remembered not just through the words, but through the picture of what's happening, through the symbols of what's being used. All of that is part of the memory, memory of the, the, the church. It was normal to share bread in the Passover meal, so this could have been part of a, the ordinary Passover meal. But then, then, then he says, he, he gives it to them and says, this is my body which is given to you, do this in remembrance. For me, I think he means that they should eat this bread and that in eating it, while they're eating it, they should remember, they should remember him. He broke the bread, gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given to you, do this in remembrance of me. You might wonder what it means. I don't think they were supposed to keep a piece of bread in their pocket. He means eat this bread, and that's the way we celebrate the Lord's Supper and have it in the earliest times. We take the bread, we eat the bread, and the reason why we eat the bread is so we can remember Jesus, which is the main point of the whole last Supper. The bread that we eat is in remembrance of Jesus. What, what about Jesus? He says, this is my body, so we're supposed to remember the, the body of Christ. Right? He was the Son of God, but He was a man with a body. When we, when we eat the bread, we remember the body of Christ, the incarnation of, of, of Christ, the life of Christ, His human body, which was given for them in every sense. He came to earth for them, He lived and suffered for them, and died for them, and He rose for them. Um, the giving of His body, which they're supposed to remember, is only for their benefit. It's, it's only for the benefit of those who belong to And certainly, you know, this means that we remember Jesus' love. So you could say, take this bread, eat this bread, remember me. You'll remember the love of Jesus. By the way, Jesus is nothing like a Passover lamb. Jesus gave himself. The, the lamb is sacrificed entirely in the hell of whoever sacrifices it. So, when Jesus' body is given, of course it's a giving by God, but it's a giving by Jesus himself, who is the sacrifice. Right? And so, when we eat the bread and we remember Jesus, we remember that Jesus deigned to come on earth as a man in the first place, to live a, a filthy life like we do among the centers and people trying to, to pull him down. He gave his life for us, and so we understand his love and God's love. But I think that his death is more than just a symbol of the love of Jesus and the love of, of God. Because we also understand from other teachings of Jesus that Jesus' giving of his life was in some sense, some way, some marvelous, strange way, a ransom for, for many, a price that's paid, an atoning sacrifice. Jesus, in that sense, is like a, a lamb who is sacrificed. But it's a, it's a lamb who, who knowing he sacrifices himself. Right? He's trading his life for our sin. He comes and takes a life, and then he gives the life in exchange for our, our, our sin. All of that, I think, 
I'm supposed to remember that these are transmissions my body would submit to you. Do this, keep this in remembrance of me. We remember his giving, we remember his love, we remember his sacrifice. We also remember what it accomplishes for us, namely that it's offered in trade for our sins and payment for our, for our sins. And then that final thought, that, that that's part of our remembrance, that the Jesus' body is in exchange for, for the penalty for our sins, leads into the next symbol, which is the cup. And the cup kind of draws out this latter significance that the light Jesus pours out and the life is in the void, you know, the Bible always says the life Jesus pulls out, actually goes out and accomplishes something for our benefit. It's not just that he gave up his life, it's what his giving up life accomplishes, we're supposed to remember. So verse 20 says, Verse 20, he says, and likewise, as in the same with the bread, the cup is the same as the bread in the sun. It's, 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 a, it's a symbol of kind of the same thing, but it's a different symbol with, with some different words used to, to describe it. And likewise, the cup, after they eat, saying, he gives it to them for drinking, says, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So, yes, he gave his life. Yes, it showed his love. Yes, it had a, an, an effect. But the effect now is made more clear because he's saying that the, the blood, the life that's poured out by Jesus for us, constitutes a new covenant in, in my blood. New covenant means there was an old covenant in, in, in blood. There was. There was an old covenant, an old testament, which was inaugurated in the shedding of a lot of cow's blood. Now there's a new covenant, which is inaugurated in the shedding of, of, of the blood of Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God. So just like the new blood is infinitely better than the old blood, the new covenant is infinitely better than the old covenant. Like a lot of people say, if there wasn't something wrong with the old covenant, we wouldn't have needed a new covenant. There is something wrong with the old covenant. What's wrong with it is it doesn't say anything. It can atone for sin and many wonderful things about the old covenant and the law, but, but, but the new covenant in the blood of Jesus is fundamentally different, fundamentally better, and more permanent. And that's what Jesus wants them to remember every time they eat bread and drink wine, is he gave his body, he gave his blood, it's of his love, it's of God's love. But it also shows the accomplishment of, of a new covenant to replace the old covenant under the laws of Moses. And so in case you want to look, look it up, oh, I'm way over time because I think from this point. The, the old covenant and how the blood, you know, was, was used, cow blood, you can read in Exodus 24, verse 8 and following. But the new covenant in Jesus' blood here echoes the prophecy of Jeremiah in verse 31, in chapter 31, verse 31 and, and following, which speaks of the new covenant that God is going to create the hearts of his people by giving us a new heart. Right? The, the prophet says, in, in the new covenant, the new earth, in the new creation, when the kingdom comes, we're not going to be like the old us only in truth. No, no, no. We're going to be completely replaced. The old us will be taken away, and there will be a new us. And there's going to be a new covenant. What's right is going to be written in our heart. So that's what we desire to do is only what God also desires to do. So that it will be impossible for us to sin because in exercising our free will to do exactly what we want to do, since it's written on our heart now, every, what we want to do is what God wants us to do also. And so there's no sin in the covenant that Jesus accomplishes in the us because he makes people finally like himself who can theoretically sin but can never actually sin because it will never be that their desire to sin. The will of God will be people. In this new covenant, will be one of, its, one of the same. But then he goes on and says, "But this but plays off against the wonderful new covenant which Jesus is accomplishing through his sacrificial death." But behold, it's, it's like, oh, but a contradiction, right? But opposite the thing that I just said. Even so. Look, it's like a scandal that's amazing. But behold, look, 
the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the dead. So Jesus is saying that this new covenant, his blood, is he's establishing for his disciples who are there with him at the table. There is the shocking, strange example of Judas that we all struggle to understand what to do with. Because Judas had, was a chosen disciple. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He cast out demons. He healed and all of the other things that the disciples did during Jesus' ministry up to this point. And yet, when the time came, Satan entered into him. And he became Jesus' betrayer. And he's one of the twelve sitting there commemorating the first position, the first Lord's Supper, the symbols that signify all that Jesus came and accomplished for, for people who believe in him. And so it's shocking that Judas would do that, and even more shocking that Judas would be sitting at the table while they're watching about Jesus' sacrifice. And I was thinking, maybe there's always a hand like that on the table. Every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, you know, Paul says you should examine your heart, otherwise you, you dream to judge your heart on yourself. And all this kind of There's always a hand of the Jews on the table whenever Christians gather to celebrate the Lord's Supper because we go ahead and celebrate despite the fact that we trace Jesus. Probably each of us has been Judas at the Lord's Supper sometime in that sense. But, but certainly there's always, every time we gather to celebrate the Lord's Supper, there are people that are celebrating the Lord's Supper with Jesus, pretty much like this. But shouldn't be, because they're betrayers of Christ at that point, and, and, the, and that, that, that meal is not good. Not We're almost done. So he says, For the Son of Man goes as has been determined, but water that man by whom he is betrayed. So last week somebody asked me, you know, why did Jesus allow this to happen if he's so powerful and he knows everything? Why did he allow Satan to be Judas and Judas to betray him, you know, to the to the Jewish leaders and, and to the And here's the simple answer you know, Jesus is giving. He says, For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. He goes out of this world the way it has always been planned that he would go out. So that he can come back to this world and return as, as the Son of Man in the time and usher in the kingdom. Jesus has the power to stop Satan. He has the power to stop the Judas. He has the power to stop the cross. But it's always been planned that, that Jesus would come and go to Jerusalem and be betrayed and die and rise again. Jesus is plan A, not plan B. It's not like God created the universe and said, whoop, there's a mistake. Let's send Jesus to fix it. As if Jesus were second thought, plan B. No. Since before God created the universe, Jesus was there as the object of all creation. I think the whole New Testament teaches that. It's a perfectly orthodox statement that I'm making. So Jesus goes because that's what Jesus was always going to do. He even desires to stop it. Three times in the garden of Gethsemane, he prays to stop it because it's not. This is the way we're, 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 we're going to do this. Right? So Jesus is God's one and only plan for creating and saving eternal children of God. It's, it's, this is the work of Christ. It was always laid out from, from the beginning. So you can have some, this, this, a lot of people see a problem here, and I have sympathy for the Judas, for sure. He betrays Jesus. But I think that one thing we have to realize is that apart from the grace of God, every single one of us is Judas. If we exercise our free will with no <coughs> help from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we would do exactly what we or some people <laughs> Judas' betrayal of Jesus is an act of free will. God doesn't force Judas to betray Jesus. God just withdraws his, his, his protection and lets Satan go. Right? Satan can corrupt any one of us into doing any awful thing if it wasn't for the help and protection of God. So the general case of what Christians is that we know that we're Judas except for Except for God is saving us from the time Jesus, right? Any good thing we do is something good God is doing because if God left us to our own desires, we would surely go to hell. And so Judas is a picture of caution for everyone of, of what we would look like if, if, if God took a step backwards 
and let Satan and sin and temptation have its way its way with us. And that's why Jesus keeps telling his disciples to be awake, to be ready, to be ready, you know, so that you'll be able to stand before the Son of God. But none of us can stand before the Son of God without the help of the Son of God and the Holy Spirit, God the Father. And it's probably important to know that while Jesus allowed himself to be killed, Jesus didn't kill himself. He didn't come to Jerusalem and commit suicide. No. It was evil men and, 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 and the devil that killed Jesus. But only because Jesus let that happen. He only let it happen because that was, that was the plan to get from, from the very beginning. Okay, so let's stop. Uh, 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 sorry, there's one last verse. Let's see. But it says, and they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this, and that's the end of tonight's reading. So of course, it seems shocking to the disciples to hear that one of their number might actually betray Jesus. Jesus just said that. But from this verse 23, I gather that it wasn't obvious to any of them that it was Judas. If it was obvious that Judas was the one evil one in their midst, they wouldn't have been having this heated discussion trying to identify who, who it was. And I've often thought the verse also suggests that every single one of them was afraid that maybe it was them. Right? And so, that's another thing that's gotten all the question because they all know that, that it could be them. And we know that it could not be all of them because in the Garden of Gethsemane, the way Luke found it, all of the disciples fell asleep, even though Jesus asked them to stay awake and pray. And later, Jesus denies, I mean, Peter denies Jesus three times. So, every time the power of God would draw from us, we'll do the most incredibly awful, awful things. It's, it's in all of us to be Peter, it's in all of us to be one of the disciples sleeping, it's in all of us to be Jesus, too. Mm. That's the, the warning. I hope God found a way to say to do this somehow. I don't know if that's heresy to say. I feel sorry for him. But I don't want to be him, right? We don't want to be Jesus. And the only way we can not be Jesus is to beg God, please don't let me be Jesus. Please help me. No, please keep me away. Please help me to pray. Because I don't want to be Jesus. And I guess to be Jesus, you first have to be an apostle. So I, so I mean, a Jesus wouldn't be a Christian, do who betrayed Jesus. Again, I apologize not only for the words, but for my technical difficulties. Please pray for my laptop. It'll be the morning I wasn't I didn't have to do a laptop in my budget. Uh, let's pray. Dear God, what you have planned from before the beginning of the world and what you have accomplished already in our sight is a miracle far beyond anything that we can properly comprehend. And, and yet you give us your spirit uh, and your word so that we can glimpse some of it. And you help us you know, by, by letting the part that we can glimpse be enough to turn us in your direction and to, and to begin to grow faith in us and to begin the, a, a process by which you sanctify us to your spirit so that finally, hopefully, we can all of us in this class be among those who live in the resurrection and stand joyfully in the presence of the Son of Man and live eternally in the kingdom of, of God. We understand that this is the, all of the work that you're doing from the time before you created the universe until now and until when the universe begins. All of this is somehow related to preparing us to be such children, and we pray that we're, we're counted among them. Please continue to give our sins. Please continue to protect us in, in righteousness. Please continue to teach us so that our knowledge of the things we read in the Bible are, are, is uh, uplifting and edifying, and, and never please let us play funny games with scripture or use your word in any, in any long way. And please help us not to be Judas. Please help us not to be sleeping disciples. Please, please help us not to be right Jesus. Please, O oh Lord, be our, uh, our goodness and our thirst. Please live in us, guiding us to do the things that you want to do in us at all times. 
please uh, help people in this class get home safely tonight and back again safely next week. We will see Will. We'll, we'll continue to read Luke's gospel tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>